And one of the things when, when we start thinking about rejection, there's really two sides of rejection. One of them is when you are someone who is rejected, and then the other one is if you are the person who does the rejecting. And as we start thinking about rejection, I, I, I looked it up in the dictionary. What, what are we talking about when we talk about rejection? And some of the uh, explanations of it are to refuse to have or grant, to refuse to accept, or to discard as useless or unsatisfactory. When you think about that, it, that when I'm rejected, that I'm discarded as someone who's useless or unsatisfactory. And, and so as we begin, I'd like you to start with, first of all, thinking about the times when you've been rejected. Maybe for some of you, there, there are times immediately when, when that comes to your mind. For me, it, it, I can remember probably when I was, I don't know, 12 years old, maybe 10, 12 years old, going to Great America, Six Flags Great America. Uh, it was near Chicago. And I went there with my older brothers and sisters. And, and I remember whether it was Wild E. Coyote or Bugs Bunny. Uh, Bugs Bunny had the carrot and said, you must be at least this tall to ride the roller coaster. And at that time, I also had this height challenge that I continue to struggle with today. And I remember going up there and just wanting to go on those roller coasters and being this, this close and them telling me, no, you, you cannot go on these rides. Uh, and, I, and I told him, you know what, I'll hold on really tight or I'll, I'll, I'll be with my older brother and he'll make sure that I don't fall out. And, and they just wouldn't listen. They said, no, you can go over on the, the carousel on those little ponies and, and ride on those and, and you'll be very safe. Rejection. And, and so there are times we go through life with that type of rejection. Maybe there are times if, if we apply for a job and and they reject our application, and they say, no, we, we went a different route. Or maybe if someone, as they consider going to school, they want to go to a certain college, and, and they're rejected and, and told, no, uh, we are not going to let you in. You're unsatisfactory. But I think the time when rejection hurts the most is when it's done on a, a personal level. And that is maybe when, when you think of someone that you like and, and someone that you might be interested in, in seeing about a relationship. And, and so a, a, a young man, young boy, whatever, asks a girl, you know, would you go out with me? And then he's rejected. And, and maybe she's nice. Maybe she says something like, you know what, I think of you more as a friend. Or, you know what, uh, at this time in my life, I, I got a lot of things going on, and I'm, I'm really not going to date anyone, and I'm not interested in a relationship. Or, you know, it's not you, it's me. And, and, and they're very nice, uh, which is, I suppose, a, a lot better than if you were the last guy on the face of the earth, I still would not go out with you. Uh, maybe it, it's better than having that type of rejection. But the truth is, is that when it comes to rejection and, and another person telling us no, that the, we can easily feel like we are unsatisfactory, uh, that we are, are useless, and, and it is, it hurts uh, in, in so many different ways. And that's why this fear of rejection sometimes keeps us from doing certain things where we think we might be rejected. But there are also times when, when we are on the other side of rejection. And I happened to go to Maryvale, Ball Diamond, where the Brewers played the Diamondbacks on Friday and was there for a couple hours, got to catch some of the game. And I got to see rejection. I got to be part of rejection. It was awesome. First of all, there, there was a fly ball uh, hit into the stands and a guy there getting ready to catch it and it hit his hands and, and fell out of his hands, and everyone booed. That's rejection. And, and so, could you do that with me today? Could you just, all of us together, boo? Together? Boo. Yeah, a little louder. Okay, okay, you got the idea. So, so that happened early in the game, and then about the fourth, fifth inning, 
the center fielder was playing catch with, uh, with the right fielder, and it was, the Indian was about to start, so he took the ball, and there was a, a little girl with her baseball mitt, and actually she had a Diamondbacks cap on, and uh, the, the center fielder ran towards her by center field, and she had her glove up, and he threw the ball, and a 40-something-year-old man with a glove catches it over top of her and then runs with the ball to show his friends. Now I want you to, to give me an example of the boo that I, we heard then. Boo! I mean... <laughs> until he was shamed into giving the ball to this poor girl. And, and everyone there, it, it, was, it was, yeah, it was something. And, and so that rejection, think about that, where this person who dropped the ball, I've never met them, know nothing about them. He, he could be like the greatest guy in the world, you know, helping children with cancer and, and you know, just doing all these wonderful things but I'm booing him based on the dropping of this, of this ball. Or, or the other person as well, that, that you don't even know them, but immediately there's, there's not only a reaction, but there is a loud reaction that shows this judgment and rejection of, of what he has done and ultimately of him. Now, as we go through this message tonight and we talk about this rejection, the rejection we're talking about is the rejection of Jesus Christ by, by the people. And where we're at in, the hist- in this week, last week of Jesus' life is after he has gone, he's coming on Palm Sunday, uh, Monday, Thursday, the, the Thursday before Good Friday is when he gave the Lord's Supper, that he, he went to the garden at night, uh, he was betrayed by Judas, he was arrested, he was tried that night, and then early that morning is when he went to the Roman leader called Pontius Pilate. And it's at this time when he's meeting with Pontius Pilate that we are going through specifically and we are going to see the rejection that, that Jesus went through, the rejection of the people and, and the steps that went on. And, and what we're going to see, first of all, is what he went through uh, from, from a rejection standpoint, but then also to see what it's like f- for us and, and definitely for those people at that time, but also for us as we look at Christ and, and even though we might not consciously think that we're doing this, that we also in our lives reject him and, and to identify those times uh, so that we, we don't do that anymore and then finally see how he accepts us, uh, how as our ultimate fighter, even though this rejection comes, he continues to act faithfully and in love. So where we begin is way back at a time in Jesus' ministry, early in Jesus' ministry, so we're gonna get back to this last day of his life, but this goes back a couple years earlier, and there was an individual named Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night. And Nicodemus was someone who was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, one of these individuals who, who basically was part of the group that was trying to kill Jesus. And, and this is earlier before they had made specific plans to kill him. And what he does is he comes to Jesus at night so no one knows he's there, so, so no one from this, the, the Pharisee group or these teachers of the law or a group called the Sanhedrin, which was their, their, the, the leader of, leaders of the people, so no one would know that he was there because he had questions. He was struggling with Jesus and everything Jesus was doing. And uh, in John 3, verse 2, this is recorded for us. Jude, or excuse me, Nicodemus comes. He came to Jesus at night. So Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And I think this is, this is a very important thing and a very important place for us to start from the mindset of the people that we are going to encounter today who rejected Jesus. Because Nicodemus finally comes to Jesus and he's honest about the struggle that these leaders are having. And and the truth of the matter is, 
they knew Jesus came from God in the same way that they knew John the Baptist came from God, but they were maybe afraid about what they were going to lose. They, they didn't like Jesus' popularity. Who knows? There were, there were a number of reasons why these, these men just could not and would not follow Jesus. And so Nicodemus, refreshingly, is honest that, that there's got to be something to what Jesus is doing. And they recognize that by his message and by the miracles that he performed. Now we go from there, fast forward to this last day of Jesus' life. And this is in Mark 15, verse 1. It says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. They were making plans, and their plan was a plan that they had been working on. This was a plan to kill Jesus. And so in the blank you can write, the religious leaders made their plans. They made their plans. They were going to do what they wanted, and nothing would stop them. They had their plan, and and the plan was to get Jesus. And, and, and before we even go any farther, I, I think it's important as we look at their plans and God's plans, and I guess at some point we should talk about the way we plan as well. One of the things we do, I've talked about before, is we have these soap diaries, soap journals that everyone on our staff does. And every day we read the same uh, reading uh, together, and then each one of us picks a verse that's special to us, and we write it down, and we, we just journal, and then we share our journals with one another. And actually, the notebook that I have that I write my, my soap journal in is a gift. It was a gift from Doug, Doug Farnsworth gave it to me, gave it to me for Christmas. And on the front of that is a passage from Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And I, that, that verse just sticks out because every day when, when I go to do my Bible reading and as I write my verses down and my thoughts, I read that verse every day. And what I love about it is it shows with the plans of God what goes through his mind. And what goes through the, the, the plans of God is you. You are in God's plan. That when you look at the plan of the whole world, uh, the plan of Jesus Christ, all of that was made with you in mind. And, and for you to understand that is so important because by contrast, when we see these, these Pharisees, these leaders of the people, Jesus was not in their plans. And, and Jesus was not in their future. And now my question to you is, when you think about your plans and, and, and where you're going, is God a part of that? Does, does, does not only does Jesus fit in your plans, but do your plans revolve around him? And one of the, the things that I've found is that when I go and meet with people, Jesus is not even on their radar. Okay, that, that, that they don't even think of him when, when they're going through just basic things in their life. And, and sometimes when I'm, I'm dealing with individuals who are going through and they're, and they're doing things that are wrong, they're doing things that are sinful. And one of the questions that I ask them is this, that as they're going through something that's harmful, something that's sinful, I ask them, if I could show you from God's word that what you're doing is wrong and harmful to you, and it was perfectly clear that that's what God says, would you stop it or would you stop doing it? I hear the answer no well over half of the time. And it blows me away. It blows me away because it's the same concept where, where the Pharisees are saying, we know that you're a man from God from the, the, the miracles that you've done. You must be from God. But then it follows up, but you're not in our plans. 
And, and when I talk to individuals and tell them, this is what God's word says. Do you believe that, that the Bible teaches what God wants and what is best for us in the plan of salvation? And they say yes. And then I ask, is that going to be what you are going to follow? And they say no, because it's, it's not what I want to do. I'm telling you that this is the first step of rejection. And, and it, it's the first step down a road that you don't want to go down, but we're going to go down it tonight to see where it leads. The very first step, is Jesus in your plans? Is Jesus in the driver's seat of your life taking you where you need to go? We go on. So now Jesus isn't in their plans other than to kill him. And in Mark 15, verses three to five, the chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. And I love the word here, this word, Pilate was amazed. Pilate was blown away, okay? He was just, he couldn't believe that Jesus wasn't saying anything. And, and, and part of this, I told you for the Ultimate Fighter series, I watched all the Rocky movies, so I would get ready for Ultimate Fighter. For this one, with this rejection in Pilate, I had to watch Judge Judy all week, just to see this whole trial thing, you know, and, and kind of get in the mood for trial. And what amazes me in that show is that these people can't not talk when someone is saying something about them that might be true, I don't know, but they're the denial, it's just, it's like they sit there and they can't, every fiber of their being keeps them, and that's just not true, and of course they, you'll get your chance, just relax. And, and so for, for Judge Judy or whoever it is, that's, that's like business as usual. That, that's just the normal thing that goes on. And for Pilate, it had to be the same way. And, and just to, to listen to them accusing, they're, they're just throwing dirt at Jesus just to see what will stick. Now, during this time, uh, I, I got another verse, and, 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 and these are gonna all fit together, so bear with me. And that's Proverbs 16, verse two. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. And the reason why I, I bring this verse is because notice they are accusing him of everything, all of these different things that they're accusing him of. And, and again and again, these accusations, but what they have hidden is their motive, it, it, what they're really after. And what I find interesting about Pilate is the next verse, Matthew 27, verse 18, for he, Pilate, knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. You, you know, we look at the things that Pilate does and the fact that he sentenced Jesus to death and that was wrong and uh, he washed his hands of Jesus' blood when in reality, uh, you know, he is to blame. But make no mistake about it, Pilate was a lot of things, but stupid was not one of them. And so as they are coming and they're making accusations against Jesus, Pilate saw right through them. And when you think about the accusations that, that uh, they were making, well, he said he was a king and that uh, we only have one king and that king Caesar. Another time, he, what he said is you shouldn't pay taxes. And, and we think that's just horrible that he would do this. Uh, and, and when you think about this, these people that hated the Roman government, that as Pilate was listening to this, he's like, are you kidding me? All of a sudden, you guys care about who pays taxes to us and who doesn't? That's, that's a joke. Or, or, or someone claiming to be a king? And, and so Pilate, as he saw these things, he knew the, the Jews well enough. I don't know how well he knew Jesus, but knew that this wasn't adding up. And there was a difference between what their motives were, the motives of envy, and all of these excuses and, and, and why they were bringing these things and, and, and giving the excuses of, of why they were there. And so in the blank you can write, reject Jesus and you will reject the truth about what is right and wrong. 
but you still might try to hide it. So, so these people, what do you expect them to say? Pilate, we're jealous of him. We're afraid he's gonna take our position as, as leaders of the people, so we need you to kill him for us. That, it, for the, them to just come clean like that, e- even though Pilate down deep kind of knew it, See, this is the next step. The next step when when Jesus is not part of your plans, now what you have to do is you have to make excuses why he's not part of your plan, and they need to make sense. So so we need to rationalize these things. Uh, We we need to come up with excuses so that people won't see us for what we are. Now, I'm going to give you an example of one. We do this for every sin we do. I'm, I'm just telling you, but, and I, I don't want to use this one like to go too overboard on it, but an example of this. For some reason as a pastor, when I see people who haven't been in church for a while, they feel obligated to tell me why they haven't been in church for a while. And, and so you, you see them, and I don't even bring it up because I, I don't want people to feel that way where they haven't been in church for a while. I, I don't want to be like in their face, like, where you been? I'm more like, I'm just happy you're here now. I, seriously, I am. But usually when that happens, the, the excuses come. And, you know, we got the kids, you know, getting the kids up on Sunday morning is so brutal. You know, it's so hard and, and they're just, uh, they, they just didn't want to get up. Uh, we only have one family day where we can sleep in, and, uh, and so, you know, that's kind of what we've been doing, and, uh, oh man, how many, of these ex- how many of these excuses, I don't want to give them all to you uh, for you to use next time. But I always, used to, I always used to laugh at that a little bit because, especially when people told me that getting the kids up is just, I got five kids. And, and my wife used to play the, the piano every service. So it was a deal where on, on Sunday mornings, we're getting up like at 6.30. And they're saying they can't get up by 9.30 to get to a 10 o'clock service or by 10.30 to get to 11. And you're like, you know, save it. I don't even want to hear it. What would be refreshing is for you to tell me, I don't love Jesus enough to come to church and I'm confessing that to you, will you forgive me? And I would, and it would be over with. You see, that's, and okay, I understand I might be overstating the issue, but this is the point. This is the opposite of confession. The the reasons that you come up with, all of which mask the motive, which mask the sin, which mask the part that they just hate Jesus. And that's why they're there. They have rejected him. They have rejected his word. And this is what naturally follows. But there's more. There's more to follow. Mark 15, 6 to 11. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did, and which was to release one person. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. This is crazy. Okay, think about this. This Barabbas guy is now a murderer. And, and this is, think of in terms of a, of, of a serial killer. Uh, someone that they've been after for a while and, and finally had the opportunity to, uh, to arrest and to get on death row because that's what would have been happening with Barabbas. He would have been the person hanging on a cross later that day. And, and now this to get these people, because by choosing Barabbas, you're putting another murderer on the street. I mean, it it just defies logic. So in the blank, right, once we reject Jesus and the truth, we make incredibly bad and harmful choices. 
We make incredibly bad and harmful choices. And you know why we do that? Because if you take Jesus out of the equation, and you take the truth out of the equation, bad choices are all that are left. Where else are you going to go? Where are you going to go for answers? Where are you going to go for help? And as I started thinking about that, I started thinking in that in my own life, and I, I need you to talk about it in yours and think about this as well. What are bad choices that you make? The places where you go that, that are just harmful, that, that you know you go there and, and they just, they don't help the situation, and if anything, they perpetuate the, the, the situation and they hurt you. One of them, a place where people go the most is self-medication. That where do I go when I'm hurting? That if I'm not going to go to Jesus and I'm not gonna confess my sin and tell the truth, where are you gonna go? Self-medication is one that, that I see so often. Alcohol, drugs, food, whatever. I mean, you name it, whatever your drug of choice is with self-medication, that's where we go. And, and you make bad choices that after you make them, you're like, oh, why did I do this? This is so harmful to me. Uh, this isn't what I wanna do. I also look at this with, with, with families, with, with kids that don't know Christ. What is it that, that if you eliminate Christ and you eliminate the truth, gangs, uh, other people who are gonna support me, who are going to keep me safe, uh, a place where I can go and I'll feel accepted in one way or another. Young women, when, when they wanna get out of a bad situation at home, where do they go? Oh, to someone who's going to treat me good. Uh, and, and so I, I'm going to go there, and then I find out they're not my friend. It's how kids get caught in prostitution and gangs, those types of things. And, and in your life, you might say, you know what, I don't have those issues. But what is your issue? What is your bad choice that, that you find yourself going in a cycle again and again and again and finding out how much it hurts you? We continue. Where this goes then, Mark 15, 12 through 14. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And now they're at this point, with these, these people are at this point where they, they realize that they have taken a step and that Jesus is not going to be the route they go. To, Jesus needs to be out of here. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna hear about him. I don't wanna listen to him. I don't wanna see him. Jesus needs to die. Jesus is dead to us. Just get rid of him. And in Isaiah 53, uh, when writing about this, this is what he, Isaiah wrote. He was despised, talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. This is the rejection. And, it, and it, this is the ultimate, I think, low point for Christ. When everyone turned against him, when, when finally everyone said, we want to have nothing to do with you. But this is also the time that as Christians, we need to understand that this is at a time where Jesus was being rejected, this is when he showed his greatest faithfulness and acceptance to us. And I want you to just take a, take a, take a moment to think about that. At a time where in your deepest rejection, at that lowest point, and this is one of them where Christ, as he's being rejected, continued to offer his love and, and, and definitely continued to go through with it. I think of this as one. I think of a time when he was being nailed to the cross. Father, forgive them for they knows not what they do, doesn't know what he's doing. Or, or finally when the thief on the cross uh, asked Jesus for forgiveness and he gave it to him. I think of those times when, when Jesus is going through this being despised, being uh, rejected, as it says, 
like one from whom people hide their face, that, that the suffering now has gotten so bad that it's just hard to look at it. It's like a train wreck where you, you can't look, but you can't look away either, that there's a, a morbid sense of curiosity on what is going to take place. And that's why at, at a time like this, that, that it's to remember that Jesus also loves us at those times when we are rejected. That is when he comes to us in our greatest moment of need. The Bible tells us that that Christ showed his own love for us in this, that that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is a picture of what that passage is talking about. Even when we push him aside, even when we reject him, even when we say, Lord, we don't want to have anything to do with you, Jesus comes to us and acceptance and love, giving himself as a sacrifice willingly to show us even then and in that time that we are loved by him. Continues Mark 15, verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. The important part of that verse that I want you to maybe just put a mark next to is the first part, wanting to satisfy the crowd. And and now you see where the rejection of of Pilate, Pilate's rejection of Jesus where he came from, that Pilate had a choice. That that Pilate, as he looked at it, it, it was either a rejection of the crowd and what they wanted, or it was a rejection of of Jesus. And, And as he thought about that, who he wanted to make happy and he's like, this is a no-brainer. If, if I have to disappoint one person as opposed to this whole crowd that's going to uh, riot and revolt, uh, that's easy. Jesus is going to die. Funny part is, when you try to satisfy the crowd, what do you think Pilate's approval rating was that day? And then the next week? It's zero. These people hated him. And, and even doing that to try to satisfy them, they would never be satisfied as opposed to Jesus. John 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And in the blank you can write, Christ battled rejection by playing to an audience of one. Christ battled rejection by playing to an audience of one. I cannot tell you how liberating this is. That that as Jesus was going through his life, he was not worried about the approval of Pilate. He was not worried about the approval of the people. He was not worried about the approval of the leaders of the people. That as he went forward, there was only one approval he was looking for, and it was from his Father in heaven. And he received it. When he was baptized, a voice from heaven came down. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The ultimate approval would come just a couple days later when Jesus rose from the dead as proof that God did approve of his sacrifice, that he did win this battle over over sin, death, and hell. And so as Jesus went through life with only looking for the approval of his Father in heaven, it gave him remarkable clarity on what needed to be done. And, and as we look at our own lives, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the decisions you make. Remember, this all started with a plan, right? This, this started with a plan that does or does not include Jesus. And, and then the decisions that come from that plan and the rationalizing. Now I want you to imagine how this affects your life. For me, personally, when I do a message, for probably 15 years, when I would go out and I would come out and I would say, Lord, please help me not to make a fool out of myself in front of these people. That, that was my prayer. Because I was struggling as a pastor, getting anxiety and panic over trying to please the people that were there listening. It's a horrible way to do ministry. Instead, now the prayer I pray is, Lord, if I make a fool out of myself, 
may it be to your glory. That's plain to an audience of one. Now I want you to think about having that in your marriage. No longer am I trying to please my wife in my marriage, and, and no longer is she trying to please me. But that when we look at, at, at the plans we make, that we ask ourselves first and foremost, how is it that in our relationship with one another that I can please God? And, and what that looks like is, is it's not even about decisions anymore. As much as it is, because I have the answer to that question, Love your wife in the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Who doesn't want to be married to a guy like that? And, and, and as she looks at the, the showing of respect back and the way that God wants her to, the, and, and how we grow together, plain to an audience of one. On the crosswalk staff, plain to an audience of one. Jeff and I... <laughs> are two alpha males, pastors of the same church. And, and, and I could ask the question on a daily basis, how can I get what I want at Crosswalk? And Jeff could do the same. But we don't. We do not. And, and so we look at how we approach ministry. How is God pleased by the way we get along with one another as we act as servant leaders? Where would God have Crosswalk go? And then what is my role in doing that? Just let me know and I will do it. I'm telling you, there are so many different applications to playing to an audience of one. Uh, talking to my daughter, uh, who gets very nervous before her basketball games and her softball games, that, that, that she, she, it was really bothering her. She was getting sick and, and stuff like that before games. You know, the coach doesn't think I'm doing good. The other kids on the team, I don't wanna let down the fans. And to tell her, play to an audience of one. That if you get off that court and the Lord is happy with you, with, with how you have played uh, and showed respect to other players, played hard, who cares? Play to an audience of one. I'm telling you, this is a life changer and takes rejection off the table. Because the re only rejection if you're concerned about is coming from your God. He doesn't reject you. He loves you and has shown that love through Jesus Christ and has forgiven you. And that is why you have the applause of heaven as you live for him. The final, the final part then is what this looks like in my life then. Galatians 5 verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Wow. Wow. Think about how this changes with these people who are yelling about Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. What the Christian yells is crucify me. Crucify me and all of the plans that I want to make that don't include Jesus in it. If this is a plan that, that does not lift my God up, crucify me and all of the things that I desperately want in my life that go against him. I need to die. That sinful nature in me needs to be put to death needs to be drowned in the waters of baptism and, and, and turn back to, to Christ. Another one from Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so as I, I watch Christ's crucifixion on the cross, I understand that my sin goes with him. And, and so now as I live my, my life, I, I live it for him. Christ lives in me. The center of my being, the decisions I make, the, the plans I make, the direction I go, my, my identity, my destiny in heaven, my purpose for life, all of these things are given to me by Christ. In the blank, you can write, when I reject self, I am able to live by the Spirit. When I reject myself, that sinful self, I am able to live by the Spirit. I, I'm able to play to an audience of one. Rejection's hard. I, I'm going to tell you, I, it's still to this day, it's something that I struggle with. I think at heart, I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. It's, it's, it's a weakness and something I battle against. 
and something that I needed to be reminded of on a daily basis. Maybe some of you know that struggle. But from this message, that, that just in your head, I hope it continues to ring, play to an audience of one. And the approval that you, you so desperately desire has been given to you through Christ, through his payment for your sins, through his taking on your weaknesses and giving you the approval of your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you uh, that you have sent Jesus into the world to be our ultimate fighter and help us as we we consider our lives to maybe go back and, and trace the places where our plans have, have gone wrong, where, where you're not part of them, that we, we look at those uh, situations where we've denied the truth and tried to rationalize sin, and oh my goodness, the times when we've made the bad choices, but help every person here see that even if they have made bad choices in their lives, it, it is not too late, that today is the day. Today is the day looking at what Christ has done for me and and his acceptance of me and forgiveness of me that now, today, I can play to an audience of one. Uh, Lord, that that I will live my life out of thanks for what Christ has done and uh, that as we uh, applaud Christ and what he has done, uh, Lord, we know we have your applause through what Christ has done for us. So thank you for that, and thank you that every day we can live as, as your children who are accepted by you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.